Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to explore Gnosticism. With me is Richard Smoley, who is former editor of Gnosis magazine and current editor of Quest, the Journal of the Theosophical Society in America. Richard is also author of Forbidden Faith, The Secret History of Gnosticism, as well as Hidden Wis Wisdom, The Guide to the Western Inner Traditions, and Inner Christianity, The Guide to the Esoteric Tradition. Also, How God Became God, What Scholars Are Really Saying About God and the Bible. Welcome again, Richard. Thank you, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be with you as well. I suppose when it comes to Gnosticism, uh, there's a kind of paradox. On the one hand, uh, from a Christian perspective, Gnostics, it seems to me today, Gnostics are deeply spiritual and one might even say deeply Christian. And on the other hand, it was regarded as a heresy in the early centuries of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, one thing that's become increasingly obvious with the enormous amount of scholarship about uh, Christianity and early Christianity that has been done is that very soon after Jesus' time, uh, an enormous number of what are called faith communities mm -hmm. uh, arose who understood Jesus' teachings in very, very different ways. My own personal view is that these faith communities actually did go back to Jesus' disciples who understood his teachings in very, very different ways. And he may have communicated them in different ways to different mm -hmm. disciples on the basis of their interests and abilities. So what might be a little bit of a difference between what he told Thomas and what he told Peter ends up being, um, you know, uh, one or the other uh, calling each other heresies. Mm -hmm. And one of these strains was called Gnosticism. And although it became heresy, uh, it, it was not so at first. It was just another form of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Well, I suppose one of the amazing things in, in the history of Christianity is, is how it flourished so much after the, the death of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that suggests, if, if nothing else, and I'm speaking as someone who is, is not and has never been a Christian, but it, it, it speaks to the incredible vitality of the founder mm -hmm. of this tradition. Very true. Very true. And the Gnostic strain viewed salvation in a somewhat different way mm -hmm. from what we now think of as mainstream, conventional, orthodox, Catholic Christianity. Well, let's define that term, Gnostic or Gnosis. Okay. Gnosis, well, G-N-O-S-I-S, -S, comes from the Greek Gnosis, as they pronounced it. It is related, uh, the same root as our word no, which is why we have a K, it used to be kno. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's probably the most important concept in this worldview. It's also, if I understand it correctly, related to the Sanskrit uh, jnana. Yes. Yes. Which is also the origin of the, the Buddhist term zen. Ah, okay. That part I didn't know. Yeah. Interesting. Uh -huh. Interesting. So, well, what is this knowledge? Mm -hmm. um, there was a one Gnostic author um, uh, named Theodotus who said, well, this knowledge is who we are, where we've come from, why we're here, and where we are going. Mm -hmm. That uh, And that, so basically understanding your place in the cosmos. Mm -hmm. But Gnosticism is also uh, about, shall we say, an inner awakening. Mm -hmm. Isn't and, that the key yes. right there, the idea that uh, one's spiritual truth comes from within rather than from without? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And that's why the Gnostics were very much more individualistic, very uh, eccentric. Every Gnostic ha teacher had his or her own system, mm -hmm. uh, and they look bafflingly confusing to us today, although general broad features can be picked out. But basically, the idea was that the human soul had sort of gotten itself stuck in a world of dualities, of appearances, of illusions, um, and that it was possible through certain spiritual practices, certain um, teachings, uh, to liberate oneself from them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that was kind of the, the key uh, thing about Gnosticism. Repentance for your sins, um, you know, forgiveness for your sins was kind of a secondary matter. As opposed to liberation from the entrapments, the snares of mm -hmm. the, uh, and the dualities of the material world. That's right. Now, one of the most central myths or forms that this myth takes has to do with the uh, ascent of the soul through the seven planetary realms. Mm -hmm. In those days, there were seven planets, as they called them, which include, you know, uh, Mercury, uh, Venus, the Sun was a planet, uh, the Moon, uh, Mars, Jupiter, and Pluto, uh, and Saturn. Mm -hmm. right? Those are the, the, the visible stars and planets. These were viewed as kind of surrounding the Earth in kind of a concentric rings or mm -hmm. spheres. Mm -hmm. The heavenly spheres. The heavenly spheres. And the idea was that the soul had come down from above through these various spheres and had taken on certain impurities mm -hmm. as a result of passing through them. Uh, and by the way, guess what? Um, what were these impurities? Well, they can be very, very directly related to the seven deadly sins. Mm -hmm. And the ascent of the soul was sometimes pictured as the reverse. You ascend through these seers and shed off the vice mm -hmm. associated with uh, each of them. Venus was associated with lust. Mars was associated mm -hmm. with anger. Uh, Jupiter with gluttony and, you know, mm -hmm. so on. But the ascent back up into sort of the heavenly realms mm -hmm. of the of the deities through the spheres does does suggest a visionary journey. Yes, yes, and they they probably had these kinds of visionary journeys, and we can assume that some of the Gnostic texts uh, are the results of these. Mm -hmm. Now, um, to my knowledge, there is very very little no uh, awareness or. Uh, information about how these visionary journeys were produced. It's similar in the Jewish Kabbalah. There were, there were many ascents through what were the, called the Hekalot, the, the palaces, the yes. celestial palace, of mm -hmm. which there were, oh, by the way, seven. Mm -hmm. um, but exactly how they did this, uh, you know, is something that was never written down. It yeah. was something you, it, this was orally taught. Presumably in some form of meditation or yeah. prayer. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you know, uh, often mm -hmm. accompanied with you know certain fasting, yeah. uh, austerities, uh, abstinence from sex. You know, various well, I gather things. that the Orthodox Catholic Church regarded uh, all of these Gnostic teachings as as heresies, largely because it, it, they had no means of controlling it, and I, I suppose it wouldn't have been too hard to find excesses of of different kinds uh, that led to practices that no church would approve of. Yeah, and uh, the early church fathers uh, certainly accused certain Gnostic groups of doing all sorts of horrible things. Mm -hmm. um, whether they did or not, we don't know, because guess what? I mean, you know, as you know, both Jews and Christians over the centuries have been persecuted, and they've been accused of doing horrible things that none of them have done. So who knows what, you know, what was really going yeah. on. But the church made a point of pretty much stamping out, mm -hmm. completely stamping out these various heresies. Yeah, yeah. Historically, um, it all goes back to the fourth century AD. Mm -hmm. Up to that time, uh, the, the Christian, all of the Christian denominations, but uh, were uh, they had a rather equivocal status, and um, not all the emperors persecuted them, but some of them did, and some of them were pretty harsh. Mm -hmm. Uh, in Constantine changed that in AD 313 by issuing um, an edict uh, proclaiming tolerance for all religions in the Roman Empire, including Christianity. Mm -hmm. 
and this was all well and good uh, for the next 80 years. But by that point, the Orthodox Catholic Christian Church, the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church were the same in those days, yes. right? They hadn't split. They hadn't split. Um, by the end of the fourth century, 80 years after Constantine's edict, uh, Christianity was proclaimed the official religion of the Roman Empire, and the pagan temple started to be closed down, mm -hmm. including um, Greek mystery schools, like Plato's Academy, uh, all these other things that were, um, you know, supposedly pagan. Mm -hmm. And um, the Gnostics were kind of among the victims of that. Mm -hmm. Um, if you want an interesting little sideline into this, one of our great windows into Gnostic thought is a collection of texts called the Nag Hammadi scriptures. Mm -hmm. These are texts written in Coptic, uh, basically a version of ancient Egyptian, right. um, and dated to around the fourth century, probably. Mm -hmm. They were found in Egypt. Now, what's very curious about this is, and this is speculative, but the first canon of the New Testament was uh, proclaimed in um, 367 AD mm -hmm. by a bishop named Athanasius. Mm -hmm. And he sent a letter out to every, he was bishop of, to all of the churches in Egypt and said, these are the 27 books that are, shall we say, profitable for salvation. Mm -hmm. All others are worthless and should be destroyed. Mm -hmm. Those 27 books are the 27 books of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. That is where our New Testament canon comes yeah. from. So arguably, what could have happened is there was some monastery that got hold of this letter and said, yeah, I guess we have to do this. And instead of burning these texts, they just went and buried them, mm -hmm. possibly for posterity, possibly because... I don't know, they thought they were sacred texts and shouldn't be burned or whatever, we mm -hmm. don't know. So strange, that may be exactly why these texts happen to be preserved. Mm -hmm. But as I said, that's a completely speculative yeah. uh, uh, question. In any case, the, the, the Nag Hammadi Library was in fact discovered and contained many Gnostic writings. Yeah, and um, you know, not all of them are necessarily specifically Gnostic because there are um, translated passages from Plato mm. and other things that are not, you know, Plato was not a Gnostic in any, you know, you know, conventional sense of that word. He lived long before all of this was going on. And yet there is some sort of a, an overlap between mm -hmm. uh, what we could call the Hermetic tradition mm -hmm. and older tradition going back probably to ancient Greece and ancient Egypt and maybe even to ancient Persia, uh, and Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. It's an esoteric, uh, pre-Gnostic esoteric tradition must have had some influence on the Gnostics too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think when people become interested in esoteric things, um, the external forms of the religion become less um, important. Mm -hmm. You may still observe them because it may, for example, just be for your own safety. Yes, but, or for cultural reasons. For cultural reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but you start to realize that the inner truths of your religion are starting to look very much like the inner truths of other religions. And, you know, if a Christian monk might find it very interesting to talk to a rabbi or an Egyptian priest. Um, and as a result, there'd be this enormous interpenetration. I believe this interpenetration has always been taking place. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times it had to be furtive, uh, just for, again, reasons of safety. Mm -hmm. But I believe all of these traditions, th these were people, they were always talking to each other. They were always aware of each other. They were reading each other's texts. So, it, you know, to look for a pure line of any of these traditions is a... Uh, I think just unrealistic. It, well, I've heard many people say in contemporary times that people with a deep interest in esoteric matters, that they have more in common with uh, another esoteric seeker from a different religious background than they have with the orthodox fundamentalists within their own tradition. I believe that's true. Mm -hmm. I believe that's true. And you know, then you, it becomes, well, how do you relate to the orthodox fundamentalists of your own tradition? I suspect, uh, without knowing very much about this, that Islam today is like being convulsed by similar problems mm -hmm. because the fundamentalists, the outside, get too uh, 
they get too hard, if they get too powerful, the inner meaning is lost. Uh, and this is a thing that's happened to many religions, and yeah. it certainly happened to Christianity. Mm -hmm. So it may be, it probably it's just a phase, mm -hmm. but certainly Sufis, the mystics of Islam, and the Kabbalists, the mystics of Judaism, and the esoteric Christians, um, certainly I believe all talk to each other, and they had more of the same vocabulary in common than one might think. Well, to get back to Gnosticism specifically, the uh, one of the fascinating things is that even though uh, over a thousand years ago it was pretty much completely eradicated by the Catholic Church, it, there seems to be a rebirth. Yeah, and this rebirth really can be dated back to the 18th century when at, at least a few of these texts were uh, starting to surface. Mm -hmm. And there was also an increased revolt against Christian orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. uh, and in a sense, if you were re revolting against Christian orthodoxy, uh, Protestant, Catholic, uh, whatever, uh, the Gnostics were a logical place to go to. Mm -hmm. Now, one very famous example is William Blake. Mm. You know, certainly one of the greatest poets and um, artists. In the 18th century. Yes, mm -hmm. 18th century. Now, uh, uh, there's a passage from a friend of Blake's in which he says, you know, I went over to Blake's and, you know, we're talking about religion and what ha I heard the, the teachings of the ancient Gnostics just repeated to me, you know, pretty much in pure form. Uh, so Blake, insofar as he understood the Gnosticism, uh, as it was known in his day, mm -hmm. embraced it. Uh, you know, and that is to say, the, one of the themes of this is that the God of the law, the lawgiver, uh, is, shall we say, a defective, legalistic, second-rate God, mm. and that the true God is, shall we say, a God of love and illumination beyond mm -hmm. that. Now, Blake, I think, did something very, very important because he realized that this defective God. We're referring to, uh, I think the term is demiurge. The demiurge, mm -hmm. which is from a Greek word meaning craftsman. Mm -hmm. um, the second rate God was, in a sense, part of the structure of our own minds. Mm -hmm. Blake's name for this demiurge was Urizen. Mm -hmm. Funny word, and it has many meanings. Greek, Urizen, to limit. Your eyes, mm -hmm. horizon, mm -hmm. all of these things, you know, this is the part of the mind uh, that limits and, constru and constricts. Mm -hmm. You can read, there's a book of your eyes in it, complete with uh, pictures. Yes, William Blake was a, a poet and an artist, yes. a visionary and yeah. a mystic. Yeah, and of course he was, like many people, in a, ahead of his time, he was not completely understood and not completely liked. Mm-hmm. So that would be one example of the, the, the revival. There are um, others. There, there are others. Swedenborg, I think. Yeah, Swedenborg himself, uh, Emanuel Swedenborg was a Swedish visionary of the 18th century. Mm -hmm. And he certainly didn't have, he, I don't, to my knowledge, he did not uh, embrace the Gnostics as a group past or present. But he did believe that uh, it was time for the spiritual eyes of humanity to be opened, mm -hmm. and he believed that, that was his uh, kind of his job. And he had these elaborate visions of heaven and hell, which he wrote out. His books became mm -hmm. very, very popular. Mm -hmm. He was a scientist, and he started out as a scientist. Yes, yeah. he did, and um, an engineer, and an engineer. He mm -hmm. was uh, on the Swedish board of mines. Mining was a Sweden's big business, and he mm -hmm. was connected with it. So this, you know, in in going on into the twentieth century, the most important figure to really bring the Gnostics back was uh, C.G. Jung, mm -hmm. and Jung felt a deep affinity for the Gnostics. The great Swiss psychiatrist. Yes, yep. and um, he wrote a really strange text, kind of what would be today called a channel text. Uh, it's called The Seven Sermons to the Dead, mm. and um, he wrote it in a trance state, and the speaker is Basilides who is one of the great Gnostic teachers of the second century. Mm -hmm. um, 
this is interesting. And, you know, he goes on and uses a lot of Gnostic terms in this. And uh, it's arguable that a lot of Jung's later psychology and psychiatry um, are derived from these ideas that mm -hmm. uh, are expressed there very, very cryptically. I mean, these are, this, is, this is just a few pages, but it's a very dense and, um, you know, mysterious text. Well, it, it, what you're saying suggests that Jung, who was a, a medical doctor, a psychiatrist, one of the founders of a major school of psychotherapy and psychology, derived much of his teachings from his own inner visions that were, let us say, compatible with with the work of the ancient Gnostics and, and I think the ancient alchemists and, and yes. therefore the Hermetic tradition as mm -hmm. a whole. Mm -hmm. The Hermetic tradition is, is interesting um, and if you want to talk about that for a minute, mm -hmm. um, it goes back to a legendary figure named Hermes Trismegistus. Tr Hermes Trismegistus, mm -hmm. thrice greatest Hermes, who is associated with the Egyptian god Thoth, the mm -hmm. god of learning. And, and the Greek god Hermes, obviously. The Greek god Hermes. Um, and around in the early uh, years of AD, there were these texts written, these Hermetic texts, mm -hmm. so-called after him. They they're dialogues between Hermes and his son and various people, but uh, obviously they were written to express probably some of the old teachings of the Egyptians mm -hmm. that um, were in danger of becoming lost. Um, one of the, the Hermetic texts says, has a very moving passage in which it said, um, Egypt, Egypt, no one will know of your devotions. Mm. It was a time they knew the Egyptian religion was dying, mm. which it was, mm -hmm. even apart from Christianity. Yeah. Uh, and they wanted to preserve its core and this essence, and these texts were the way they did it. Mm -hmm. And these texts came back into came back to the West during the Renaissance, and in many ways they stimulated the Renaissance. Mm -hmm. And they still continue to stimulate us, as we see from Jung's case in uh, the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Now. Would you say that the Hermetic tradition and the Gnostic tradition, uh, though, are while there may be some overlap and some mutual influences over the centuries, they're they're really distinct, to some degree. Yeah, mm -hmm. to some degree. I mean, I think um, you know the Gnostics mostly tended to view the world um, as a rather defective place in mm -hmm. general. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I don't think I think the her hermeticists, the hermetists, um, were not quite so uh, rigorous as that. When I think of hermeticism, the phrase "as above, so below" always comes to mind. Yeah, and that's from one of the key hermetic texts called the Emerald Tablet, mm -hmm. which could be written on one side of a piece of paper, mm -hmm. um, and that is. In essence, but you just quoted the first line of it, uh, and this is very mysterious. Where it was actually written, you know, uh, it's not quite clear. But it does talk about this correspondence between above and below, and these primordial forces uh, of the universe that could be worked with in certain ways if you knew how. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, as above, so below suggests that there's a, a, a isomorphic correspondence between one's inner world and one's outer world. Yeah. And the most classic form in which this was expressed um, was, in a sense, through astrology, mm -hmm. because the idea is everybody has the planets uh, in them. And what does that mean? Well, each of these planet stands for something mm -hmm. like uh, Mercury stands for intelligence, Venus stands for mm -hmm. desire, and we have these in ourselves, yeah. and their interactions, in a sense, govern who we are, dictate who we are, often uh, limit and constrain who we are. Mm -hmm. Well, would you say, to, to push the issue, that the, the cr early Christian Gnostics, were they into astrology? They... Uh, probably believed mm -hmm. that the rulers of the planets were uh, angels or gods who were not necessarily 100% friendly to humans. Mm. 
Uh, and as a result, it would be a good idea to be aware of these entities, uh, but you'd also better be aware that these entities were not necessarily your friends. Mm -hmm. Now, this is echoed in the Jewish tradition um, because the angels, contrary, you know, angels today are loving, mysterious beings who rescue you from car wrecks, right? right? <laughs> yeah. In those days, the angels, you know, even mm -hmm. the good angels, and there were bad angels, even the good angels were not always that friendly to humans. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, they, in a sense, sort of stood between. They were the, kind of these cosmic uh, bouncers, mm -hmm. and you had to get past them somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, and they didn't necessarily want you to get past them. So there's this world, this inner world that um, it's neither good mm -hmm. nor bad, but you know, it in a sense represents a series of, I don't know. Uh, steps to get through, uh, mazes to, to uh, wander through, whatever metaphor A parallel you like. universe that interacts with, with, with the you. human plane yeah. of, of existence. Well, we, uh, we're near the end of our time, and I know uh, this is such a rich and deep topic. We've just barely scratched the surface, uh, and yet uh, it's eye-opening. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's, it's a really wonderful exploration, Richard. Thank you so much. Well, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And thank you for being with us.